We knew it was going to rain and heavy that night. It's one of those things, you wake up in the middle of the night and you think, it's gonna flood. As I was on duty, I got the first national weather alert for the area of aerial flooding. Well, I get up, I was like, is it any, even raining? I was like, I'm gonna go over here and check the river. We have a river gauge on the side of the building over here on Main Street. So I was like, I'll go check the river. I checked the river, we have seven feet of water at 2 a.m. This is 2 a.m., ordinarily two feet. So we're at seven feet. I could hear it raging, and my old house had been leaking a little bit, and I heard it start up pouring. So I got up and set buckets and pans. After I had went upstairs, we heard a big, loud crash against the house. It kind of felt like an earthquake, and that's when the foundation blew out in the back of the home, and then the water filled up my basement. We got about 10 and a half feet of water in less than 10 minutes. I mean, it, it was fast. It came in, it was like ocean waves outside. Part of the story is I was moving out. I was buying my first house. I'd been saving the last five years and I actually kept trying to buy this house because I grew up in McRoberts and my family lives right up the road and I knew all my neighbors and my sons lived here for three years. And I made this post about what a good home this had been and how important it had been to us. And, it had gotten us through a pandemic. and So finally, I ended up falling asleep around 2 a.m. And we had an air conditioning unit going upstairs, and I was tired, and I fell asleep. And about 2.20, all those alert alerts kept coming through on my phone. Mine kept coming through in Spanish, so I didn't know what they were saying. About 1.30, the next door neighbors uh, started knocking on my door and told me that uh, I need to get out, that the floodwaters was already in the backyard, and it was raising quick. So I had two little dogs, two little Jack Russells. So I said, okay, I said, can you help me with my dogs? And they said, yeah, you know, so he got one dog and I got the other dog. And by then it was about two o'clock and it went from about a hundred foot from my house to I was waving water up to my knees. It came up so fast. We have goats, chickens. Um, we have a pot belly pig. Uh, we lost it. With Six goats. Six goats. We lost half our goats. And we saved the pig. And that I, was probably a sight to see. She's yeah. <laughs> well over 200 pounds. Closer to three, probably. We folded up a tarp and put it under her belly. And each of us got on the side of her and floated her out. Well, we had to float her out. <laughs> but I couldn't let her drown. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we had to try to <laughs> save her. But. She was sitting there, nothing but her nose and her eyes and her ears sticking out of the water. And that was just pitiful. You know, I couldn't... I couldn't bear that. I checked, the, opened the back door and looked out, and I said, oh, my God in heaven. And he jumped up, and he said, what's wrong? I said, you better come and look. And uh, when he looked out the door, he realized the water was already up to the carport. 25, 30 minutes is this high. And is everything I can do to keep my feet on the ground. And there's a lot of stories from friends of their friends learning about the flood when they put their feet to the floor and their legs are getting wet, you know? And, or, or, or water's lapping their elbow, you know, against the bed. I mean, that's... I was terrified for people sitting on their roofs and the current was too strong. We couldn't get them with just the kayaks. You know, last summer Walmart had kayaks on sale and I thought, where are they gonna ride these? Air River is not even high enough. It's like a creek. <laughs> but thank God everybody bought them because they saved a lot of lives. I went into her house, as it being chest deep, she were on the couch. It was obviously about neck deep to her sitting on the couch. I was able to float her up and get, got her right here. And I was like, man, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't get her over there. So actually I, I just found some adrenaline and it, I just was able to put her in that kayak and I said, we have to go, we, we, we have to go now. I cannot swim. <laughs> Here where we live, the water might rise in the back and the creek in the back and get in your yard. But when I got up, I looked out the window onto main, on the main highway here where I live on and it was a river, there was no road. Floods used to be that it would rain really hard and everybody would go to the football field and slip around in the mud and then you'd come home, get whooped because you were all muddy, but the water would have went back down. This was not like that. This was uh, bad, 
trucks floated down the road. It was a bad deal. The water in here came all the way up to this. So this whole house was basically filled with water. The woman that lived here, she needs a walker to get around and she held on to the top of her porch floating in the water for five hours until someone was able to come and rescue her. And she's, old, she's in her late 70s. One guy in particular said, uh, Gwen, you go to bed and it's all there and you get up the next morning and it's all floating away. Being a photographer, I wanted to get out and photograph what I could. Well, I couldn't photograph very much because I could only go about 100 yards out of my driveway down Route 7 toward Hazard and just saw what it was. I mean, it was just mind-blowing. One of the saddest things I saw is there is a pink Mickey Mouse child's blanket hanging from a tree right up here, up the road here. Some little child somewhere on up the North Fork of the Kentucky River, that belongs to that child. So that was tough. Some things I didn't photograph that I saw, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I ended up making probably about 2,500 images total uh, of the flood. Some of the hardest photographs I've ever made in my life. And I've seen, being a photojournalist in Cincinnati, I've seen some gruesome things before, you know, and, and had to photograph some sad things and things like that. But this hit home and it was very difficult to do. The other thing that really blew me away was the ISMIGA. So we go over Highway 15, we get and we turn down on 7, and when we turn down on 7, the uh, shopping center was in, in a river, actually. It was uh, just covered up with muddy water. Even though you were looking at it, you still couldn't really believe that it was true. I knew then that we were in trouble. And Gwen is a pillar in this community. She lives over in Knott County, but what she does for Letcher County is amazing. And to see the power of those floodwaters. Everybody thinks the flood just sort of, the water just comes up and it goes down. No. And it was like Godzilla and King Kong went in there and fought. The freezers were ripped off the walls and piled and just shelves and groceries and everything washing toward the front doors. The water was going in like a circle of motion. It was like a river. It was not still water. It was moving water. And I'd listen to him all the time and he talks about when he opened the fresh door, front door of his house, it sounded like the ocean. And that's, that's the way the water sounded. When I first seen the store, I was in shock and for about a week, I actually walked around in shock, didn't know what I was gonna do. I thought that after a flood like this, that there would be like boots on the ground. The government comes and, hi, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you or whatever. But it was a learning process where eventually it set in that, that, that there was really no help coming, at least not in that form. Uh, people coming and doing this business of mucking houses out and getting all of the things out and then gutting the walls and then applying, you know, mold killer. That was just us learning and watching YouTube videos on how to do it. And that is kind of a shocking thing to realize that it's a sort of ragtag group of volunteers doing it. Just seeing the need, the need was just so grand and still is. Yeah. It's just overwhelming and, you know, it's just hard so it could be hard to make decisions like, okay, well, which house do we go to? That's really what's so devastating about these floods. They were so extensive. They impacted so many watersheds that for weeks after the flood, you know, my dad or uh, family would be on the phone with someone and they'd realize, oh, a lifelong friend, they got flooded too. But because everybody's just been, you know, working so fast and so hard to get things cleaned up, you couldn't check in. You, know, you just couldn't check in on your neighbors as much as you'd like to. You are piecing together a life. You're piecing together culture. 
one of the things people say is how they're just so grateful and, and thankful that they didn't lose their life or lose a loved one. Most of us agree that human lives are more important than tangible objects. I think it should still be reminded that tangible objects do connect us to people and, and memories. As people begin to hear, I call them the hillbilly, hillbilly refugees, that have moved out of here, they knew we weren't going to get any help from anybody else. And they started calling and messaging on Facebook. What's it look like? Send me pictures. What do you need? So I just tell them the best I could. And when the roads opened up, they rode in here. I didn't know who the people were who were showing up to help me. Or it was people who I never expected to show up to help me. Um, like, literally. <laughs> people who have very openly disagreed with me on politics and it's become like a, a line in the sand for us of we just can't talk. They were showing up and like unloading my stuff. Or I literally turned around at one point and when I burst into tears was four teenagers who I had no idea to this day what their names were, just walked in my house and started picking stuff up and moving it out. And I just burst into tears because I was so overwhelmed but so much was being taken off of me in that moment of not having to do it all myself. We're still feeding quite a few. Um, we do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, a lot of the workers, like the Rubicon groups that come around, we feed them uh, lunches and dinner. The campsites where the famous are putting campers, we take food to them every day. We deliver to like other areas, don't have people close. We deliver meals for them. I mean, the general public can just come in and eat and don't have to worry about paying for it or anything, you know. While we were doing the cleanup crews, uh, folks were also still coming into our mutual aid headquarters to get different supplies that we had on hand. And we were also giving cash out the door um, to folks who needed it. Uh, it was really obvious a lot of people had difficulty in asking for that help and receiving that help. You know, one thing that I learned real quick was to make it very clear that it was not my money that I was giving to people, you know, I think that made people more willing to accept the cash. You know, one thing that was really difficult was just people saying how ashamed they were. And that was really hard because it's like, it's not their fault. There's nothing about this that's their fault. So that was really hard and trying to just try and alleviate that feeling of shame that people felt. So eventually after about two days, there was a load of water came with some uh, paper towels and, um, toilet tissue and some uh, paper plates. You know, I just continued to cook here because we had electricity and people were coming here and getting hot meals. We put out a call for the four-wheelers to come and they hauled what supplies we could get our hands on out to people that couldn't get out. And I noticed that the ones that have lost so much have been trying to help everybody else. My resources were my connections over 60, almost 67 years on this earth. We've got 40,000 people around the world that subscribe to what we do. That's a big audience. So the first thing we did was compile an Amazon wish list. And every day for about two weeks, UPS designated a truck whose only thing they had in it was to come to that church. I mean, some are little items, some are big items. And they came. Anything we asked for, they came. One day, I went down to the flood relief, you know, and I was down there and I was riding my four-wheeler and checking on people and taking people things they needed or whatever I could do. And I was down there at Blackie one day and the magistrate's wife called me over to the side and said, said, it's okay but we think you're in the mob. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not in the mob. <laughs> I said, I just have a lot of friends and a lot of places that want to help. We had a little GoFundMe and to be able to see people make donations of $25 and $50, but they would always make a comment of, that was my story when I grew up. So. It, it's generational, it is. They can remember good times. I remember coming in and they would give me a sucker, or I can remember coming in and they would give me a cookie. And so it's just good memories of coming somewhere where someone cares. Father Sisko, who is a priest out of Lexington, who has made two trips up here. He came the first time, bought $20,000, came back the second time, 
bought another $50,000 and had made a commitment to do another twenty five, dollars just because he wants to help. He wants Eastern Kentucky to come back up stronger. I've never known a, I've never known a Catholic, never, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, but I haven't. I'm, I'm Baptist, so I've never dealt with the Catholic. But, you know, I've learned to love him, care for him. You know, it just gives everybody a little bit more variety in their life, mm-hmm. I think. And it shows us, too, that it don't really yeah. matter what denomination you are yeah. when it comes down to us. We all want the same thing. And we does. all want to help and, you know, have a servant's heart for one another. And that's what he said. He said, you know, someone asked him, but she's not of your faith. He said, that has nothing to do with it. She's a human. Doesn't have anything to do with color. Doesn't have anything to do with anything. It's just compassion for other people. We're just kind of hanging out, wore out, you know, and wondering what to do. We just plotted our course minute by minute, you know. And this big rental truck pulls in, and these three guys get out, and uh, they can't even stand up. I was like, these guys are drunk. And uh, they said, are we welcome here? And I said, well, yeah, everybody's welcome. And uh, they said, we've come to cook for y'all. And they got these coolers of meat and brought them in here. And it was the finest of hamburger and hot dogs and steak. And they had cans of Spam. That's the funny thing. So the next morning, when I get down here, they said, we got you breakfast over here. Well, hillbillies love Spam. I mean, most of them do. And they fixed me up a a Spam sandwich on white bread. Now, I really never tasted nothing. It tastes no better that morning. And um, give me a cup of coffee. And they stayed here with us three days. I don't think they drew a sober breath while they was here. And they just kept on a cooking. That's why I call them drunk angels. They come out of nowhere and they went right back into nowhere. And we don't know. And they had ear gauges and they had big full sleeve tattoos. I mean, they were unlikely looking angels, but I really believe they were angels. I guess you could say that there is a part of that that is good in the sense that, you know, it's neighbors helping neighbors and a community helping out. But at the same time, like we only have so many resources and volunteers and we eventually hit a point where we were very exhausted and we ran out of volunteers. And uh, it just speaks to the need of you know, institutions with greater resources and money and and manpower to be available to help during times like this. She said, I mean, you know, I'm gonna go back there and I'm gonna get up every morning, look out the door, and you're gonna see family that's gone, friends that you know, their house is level. It kind of, it kind of reminds you of a ghost town. Uh, but you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. I rather people move stuff back. A lot of them says they may, a lot of them says they may not. So it's just one of them things that you have to wait and see what they're gonna do. I just don't want people to move away. The people who stayed have been so brave to try and stay, you know, and to find, and we we can do a lot with a little here. We always have been able to. And for those who are moving away, I, I get it, you know, I understand, but I just hope that we can find a way to build housing up off of the creeks, floodproof our bridges, and use this disaster as instead of the end of us, as a catalyst for a new beginning, to look at everything that makes it hard to live in eastern Kentucky and fix it. Immediately after the flood, there were reporters here from different places, and one of them said, well, what would you tell the people out there who say that they ought to just move out of there? And my answer after a few seconds thought was, I would probably give those people the same answer that folks in California who live in wildfire country would give, or those people who live in earthquake-prone areas or 
on the coast with hurricanes or um, near a volcano is that we don't want to. This is home. So this is the house that I grew up in. Um, my parents bought it uh, or moved in in 72. So they've been here 50 years now. And that's my uncle and aunt's house next door. And then flipping around this way, this is my great grandmother's house. Um, my grandmother left it to me when she passed. This is my grandparents' house here. This area is, they call it number two bottom. The reason they call it that, it was the 202 mine for consolidation. You know, and that's one thing about the flooding, particularly in this part of the, the county, is a lot of the homes are close to the river because that's where the mines were located and that was some of the flat area that the coal company had to construct these homes. So, you know, people, you know, talk about why, why do people live so close to the water? Well, Consolidation Coal Company made that decision for everybody about 100 years ago. Part of the struggle has been that we have been so closely connected to a single industry. It has really driven our economic base and our personality and who we are for a century. Once the coal boom or bus happened, I mean, you know, economically it's really difficult to figure out, well, how do you move away or how, how do you leave a place? And I haven't mentioned, like, it's, it's a beautiful part of the country, you know? It's like a really pretty place to live and you don't have to explain that to people this time of year. You know, you can just kind of look around. This is my favorite photograph so far. It's really nice. Now it has issues. Really like the way his arm set. Yeah, I love this. And I love these leading lines. They all lead you to his face. When the latest started bringing pictures of her dad's shop, and I had to look at those. That's part of the process. And that looks to be an original drawing. You can see the mold and the this one just like reaches in your heart and grabs it. So this is my dad's tattoo shop, uh, the parlor room, and it, it was doing pretty good. And the flood got to it, and so a lot of the artwork they had in there got destroyed, and a lot of their equipment got pretty dirty, and so they are working on cleaning it up and stuff and they've moved a lot of the stuff out of the shop. To be honest with you, right after the flood I ended up in the hospital because I overdid it and my sp I lost my spirit. That spirit started coming back and my strength and then looking at her photographs, she's been photographing every week her dad in that shop and seeing those. So then one day I just said, okay, now's the time. I just Click, 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 here they are. Let's run through them, let's see what we got. I didn't remember individual photographs until I started going back through them and went, you know, that's pretty good. That tells a story, this tells a story, you know. I think the other thing that affected me is when I passed those checks out for flood relief and I went to all these people's houses and I actually photographed some of those people and I looked at those right away, and I started hearing their stories. I think that had a bit of, big effect on it, too. My mind is in the right place right now, I guess. The sad thing is there's a lot of people that are affected by the flood directly and indirectly whose minds are still not in the right place and may never be in the right place again. I heard this term that I think has helped me a lot, and it's post-traumatic growth. There was a guy came, and he used that terminology. And it seemed like I just grabbed on to that, you know, because we've been um, neglected here, and some of it was our own neglect. You know, I'll shoulder part of the blame. And so, um, you know, we've kind of been wiped out, so to speak. So to me, we don't have anything else to do but build back and build better. On this property here, Holmes is a nonprofit developer of housing. Uh, we do a lot of things. Our main mission is affordable housing solutions. And we've been here before the flood. We'll be here long after the flood. But this is a piece of property that we bought, raw property that we developed into four building sites. The house that we're working on today 
is for the Morgan family who lost their home in the flood. You know, it could have been worse. We could have not. Um, could have not got out. We, we could have lost our, you know, one of our, we could have lost my dog. <laughs> you know, he he's a child. <laughs> uh, we're trying to get people onto higher ground, out of the floodplain, and and this will this will help us to do that. God has answered my prayer. I'm going to get my home, and I said it may take us a little bit, but we're going to have a home before the end of the year. And I'm so excited about yeah. that home. <laughs> We've done went and bought some furniture. <laughs> oh yeah. I think I'm still processing how to think about the future. And, you know, years ago we did this project called My Story to Tell, and someone had wrote on this postcard that we were collecting, I stayed so I could make a difference. I was wrong. And that postcard has always stood out to me of, like, I don't want to feel that way. I don't want to dedicate my life to something and then turn around and feel that way. And this flood has kind of been that moment of, like, do I stay? Can I, can I tough it out to stay and stay in a way that I want to make it better and think it can be better? I'm blessed and privileged to say I could leave if I needed to. Not everyone has that here. And I can't leave the people who don't have that option here. I don't know what comes next. I mean, I, I do think this flood was a once in many generations event. You know, th there's opportunity in this. I mean, people can build back a little better than before. They can, you know, um, prepare for the next flood, you know, because I think it's on everybody's mind with climate change. Um, you know, is the next 500 year flood going to come in the next five years? We already fought for any attention we get here. And so how do we connect it instead of fighting for those resources? How do we connect it to say, we understand what Pakistan is going through. We understand what Alaska is going through. We understand what Puerto Rico is now going through. Like, how do we build bridges so that we're not fighting for resources? Instead, we're addressing what's actually happening. Quite frankly, it's, it's gonna require a lot of federal money, um, you know, and an, and an interest in you know, supporting uh, a region that's really supported a lot of the rest of the country's growth, you know, over the past hundred years. Um, I mean, that's what I hope happens, but I think it's a, it's really uncertain. I'm 67 years old. The amount of money that we will have to do to reopen that store is going to be about 1.5, almost $2 million. Um, I'd worked for 50 years to get it to that part. We was completely paid for, but I'd prayed all my life that Simon would come in and take the store. Never pushed him, never said anything, just silently waited to see if he was going to come in. Uh, and then two years ago, he decided, hey, I, I want to be here. I planned on staying with him for the next four or five years until this happened. And then I really just had to sit down with Simon and Arthur and say, okay, I think the community needs a store. I, I, I think it's a huge inconvenience for them not to have a store. And I miss them. And then it's 25 other people here who are trying to make a living. And I want to take care of these people. They've been with me for a lot of years. We have to understand that it's not necessarily what we want to do and the way we want to go about it. Like we never wanted this to happen, but you know, it's what God wanted for us. So we've accepted that and we're gonna just try to continue to carry out what he wants us to do. Mom worked 50 years and got the store paid off, so I'm next in line to work another 50 <laughs> years and try to get it paid off. And whenever me and my wife have kids, try to do the same what her and dad did with me, not force them into it, but you know, hopefully one day they'll continue the legacy and, and all that type of thing. We plan on opening April 1, 2023. This is our home. This is our people. And, uh, we have to stick together. And it's, it's been devastating and it's been bad and it's hard, but we've just got to look forward to better times and make it come back better. I think we can come back better. I think we can come back stronger. 
I think we can come back more together. I really do.